It's time for Grounded in the Word with your teacher, Jacob Prash. Jacob teaches the whole counsel of God using the same Jewish interpretation of the Old Testament as Jesus and his apostles did 2,000 years ago. You will want to grab a pen and paper and take notes as you get grounded in God's Word. Your best defense against falling for error in these perilous times. The Lord Jesus. Open with me, please, to the book of Numbers, chapter 6, the sixth chapter of the book of Numbers, please. Most Christians who are familiar with this passage basically know it for the Jewish blessing at the end, the ironic benediction. Verse 22, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel and say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. So they shall invoke my name upon the sons of Israel, and then I will bless them. Most Christians are familiar with this Jewish blessing. Even Christians use it, although it's very important in, the, in Jewish liturgy. In fact, at my son's bar mitzvah in Jerusalem in April, this was one of the, the prayers we call bruchot, the blessings. But it comes at the end of a chapter. Now, there's no chapter divisions in the original manuscripts, but there are sections like pericopes in the Gospels and narratives and, and, and instructions in the Torah. Why does it come here? In what context is this blessing given? It's given in the context of the vow of the Nazarite. The Jewish blessing, the blessing on Israel, would come as a result or ensuing or following from the vow of the Nazarite. What is this vow of the Nazarite? Paul says, we establish the Torah, that is, the law. It is fulfilled in Jesus Yet, by understanding how it is fulfilled in him, we as believers actually establish it. In the book of Acts, chapter 21, we see Paul takes the vow of the Nazarite. In Acts chapter 21, when his belief in the Torah was being questioned, in in the 21st chapter of Acts, verse 23 and 24, Therefore do this what we tell you. We have four men under a vow. Take them and purify yourself along with them and pay their expense in order that they may shave their heads and all will know that there's nothing to the things which have been told about you but that you yourself also walk orderly keeping the law. Now Paul, of course, was not under the law of Moses. He was under the law of Christ. But in 1 Corinthians he tells us he would still keep Jewish observances in order to have a testimony to his fellow Jews. It's One thing to keep Jewish observances or any observance for the sake of your testimony. The problem is, is when you say it's necessary for salvation or for sanctification or when you engage in cultural imperialism and put it on other people and try to force your culture on theirs. Paul kept the vow of the Nazarite in a given situation. But again, what does it mean for us? Let's read Numbers chapter 6. From this... One, and again the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When a man or woman or woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite, to dedicate himself to the Lord, he shall abstain from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar, whether made from wine or strong drink. Neither shall he drink any grape juice, nor eat any fresh or dried grapes. All the days of his separation... He shall not eat anything that is produced by the grape vine from the seeds even to the skin. All the days of his vow of separation, no razor shall pass over his head. He shall be holy until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to the Lord. He shall let the locks of his hair grow on his head and let them grow long. All the days of his separation to the Lord, he shall not go near to a dead person. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or his sister when they die, because the separation to God is on his head. I think when we were last here, we explained the typology of a corpse, how a corpse is an Old Testament figure of an unbeliever. 
Jesus said we believe in him in John 5.24, we pass from death to life. Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 1, uh, we were dead in our sins and trespasses. Let the dead bury the dead. Dead bodies are Old Testament pictures of unsaved people. They defile us. But let's continue. Verse 9, But if a man dies very suddenly next to him, and he defiles his dedicated head of hair, then he shall shave his head on the day when he becomes clean. He shall shave it on the seventh day. Then on the eighth day, he shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons to the priest to the doorway of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall offer one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And make atonement for him concerning his sin because of the dead person. And that same day he shall consecrate his head. And shall dedicate to the Lord his days as a Nazarite. And he shall bring a male lamb a year old for a guilt offering. But the former days shall be void because the separation was defiled. Now this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall bring the offering to the doorway of the tent of meeting. And he shall present his offering to the Lord, one male lamb, a year old, without defect, for a burnt offering, and one ewe lamb, a year old, without defect, for a sin offering, and one ram without defect, for a peace offering. So you are getting from here, a burnt offering, it's consumed and it goes up before the Lord is worshipped. It would go actually go up. Another dealing with sin and another to bring peace. And a basket of unleavened cakes of fine flour mixed with oil and unleavened wafers spread with oil along with their grain offering and their libations. Now most of you know from our other tapes or past Bible studies here in Cedar Rapids what these things mean. Leaven is of course the figure of sin particularly the sin of pride, it begets other sin. Paul says, put away the leaven, your boasting is not good. Contributes nothing to the bread. The Passover matzah had to be unleavened because Jesus had no sin. Also beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. False doctrine is related to pure spiritual pride and it's sin. There could be no leaven. And of course the oil, shemen in Hebrew, is anointing for burial. So it is. The priest shall likewise offer its grain offering and its libation. Now in verse 18, the Nazarite shall then shave his dedicated head of hair at the doorway of the tent of meeting and take the dedicated hair of his head and put it on the fire, which is under the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall take the ram's shoulder when it has been boiled and one unleavened cake out of the basket and one unleavened wafer and shall put them on the hands of the Nazarite after he has shaved his dedicated hair. Then the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. It is holy for the priest together with the breast offering, together with the breast offering, by waving and the thigh offered by lifting up, and afterwards the Nazarite may drink wine. Notice he is forbidden to drink wine, but once the sacrifice is completed, he can. And it deals with the three strongest bones in the animal's body. Okay. This is the law of the Nazarite, who vows his offering to the Lord according to his separation, in addition to what else he can afford, according to his vow, which he takes. So he shall do according to the law of his separation. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons. Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel and say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel, and then I will bless them. Why does the blessing come after the vow of the Nazarite is completed and the sacrifice made? Why does Paul do this in the New Testament? What does it mean for us? We know, of course, Novum Testamentum and Vetere Latet, if you like Latin, the new is in the old concealed. All of this points to the Lord Jesus. He fulfills it. These things are foreshadows, types, prefiguring what he would do. Let's begin with the word Nazarite. Nazarite comes from the Hebrew word Netzer. 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 Okay? It is one letter difference in Hebrew from
Nazarene. Okay? The word Netzer means branch. Branch. Okay? So the vow of the Nazarite comes from the word Netzer, meaning branch. But it's one letter different. This is a TZ and this is a Z. Okay? It's spelled differently, one letter different. Look with me, please, to the birth of Jesus in Matthew 2.23, one of the formula citations in Matthew. And it came and resided in the city called Nazareth, that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament and applies it to Jesus and says Jesus fulfills this, this is something that theologians call a formula citation. They call it a formula citation. But there's a problem with this particular formula citation. There's no such verse in the Old Testament. No place does the Old Testament say that the Messiah shall be called a Nazarene. Did Matthew make a mistake? Was he not inspired by the Holy Spirit when he wrote this? No such verse. It's not in there. What's going on here is something that you have in Hebrew literature repeatedly. You also have it in English. It's known as wordplay. A wordplay. There was a writer who was a bit of a strange man. He was an, from Ireland. His name was James Joyce. And he had this kind of almost mystical view of a literary genre that he called the stream of consciousness. And he would write books like Finnegan's Wake and things like this. Would it be wordplay? He would use one word that sounded like another word. And sometimes he would say crazy things. One word sounding like another word, but it wasn't the same word. Like, let us synchronize our watches. Let us sympathize our watches. You know? You know, you'd almost make a joke, do it as a joke in English. But in Hebrew, you do it to catch people's attention. There's a lot of examples of this kind of wordplay in the Old Testament. One of which is the book of Amos. The prophet Amos. Amos Hanavi. Amos chapter 8, verse 2 God's judgment and destruction is coming because of their sin. And he said, what do you see, Amos? And Amos said, I see a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come for my people, Israel. The word for end in Hebrew is, in this text, ketz. But the word for summer is Kayetz. It almost sounds the same. It's a word play. The Old Testament uses it a lot. Not in the same way we use it in English, but it exists even in English. It's a word play. I see summer fruit. I see pre Kayetz. Because the Ketz is near. The judgment is coming. Okay? Summer fruit would rot quickly in the sun, it would be it. Okay, the rot is the same. Well, you have the same thing with the Nazarites. No, there is no verse that says he shall be called a Nazarene. But the prophet Jeremiah tells us this in chapter 23, verse 5. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. Okay. When I shall raise up for David a righteous, not Nazar, but Netzer, a righteous branch. The Messiah would be the righteous branch. It's a word play. It's referring back to what Jeremiah said. It's a word play. So Jesus was the righteous branch, the Netzer, and he came from Nazarene. The Hebrew word for a Christian is a Nozri. Notri, a Nazarene. 
That's the Hebrew word for Christian. Is a note three, a Nazarene, note three. Now there's a lot more to this than simply phonics and etymologically. I assure you. Note three is a Christian. Okay. So we look at this vow. This blessing would come because of this vow of the Nazarite. Now we know from the formula citation in Matthew that obviously it's a picture of Jesus in some way. The Netzer, the righteous branch, is, the, is, is a picture of the one who'd come from Nazareth. Okay, from the house of David. Okay, it says. The righteous branch of David. Now let's understand this. How and in what way is this a picture of the Lord Jesus in Numbers chapter 6? A Nazarite had wild, crazy hair. The Jews would let their hair grow and the corners of their locks grow, but as you see in Ezekiel 44, they would trim it. It would be coffered. It wouldn't just be like Charlie Manson or Albert Einstein, it looked, it was groomed. Long, but groomed. Okay. The Nazarite was not groomed. He couldn't take a razor to it at all. It grew wild. It made him look like an outcast. It made him look like somebody who had something wrong with him. It made him look like a man of some reproach. He was, in some sense, not excluded from temple worship, but excluded from the community of the temple, from the other people. He'd only approach the door to give them the sacrifice, then he'd get lost. Others didn't want to associate with him. He had to make sure that he was separated from them. He would look weird. He would look weird. There'd be a reproach on him because of the way he looked. He'd make himself conspicuously look like there was something wrong with him. And he had to make sure he stayed separated. During this period of the vow, he could not have his hair cut, but neither could he drink any wine. Why not? Let's look at Psalm 104. Verse 15 Wine which makes a man's heart glad, so that he may make his face glisten with oil. Wine makes the heart glad. In Jewish culture, wine represents joy. It is an important ingredient in almost every Jewish liturgy, feast, or ritual. You bless the Sabbath with wine. Now, by the way, in Greek, you have one word for wine and grape juice, the same word. In Hebrew, you have two different words. Yain is wine, and meat is juice. Jesus drank wine. Now, we know it was not strong drink. Proverbs forbid strong drink. Strong drink didn't mean whiskey. They didn't have spirits. Distillation was invented by the Arabs in the 8th century. It didn't mean booze. What it meant was undiluted wine, or hyper-fermented wine, like something like we would have brandy. And they weren't to drink that. But the Nazarite wasn't to have any wine. Now, Jesus did drink wine. We know because you can't put wine in old wineskins, it'll burst them. There had to be a CO2 reaction. There had to be fermentation process, otherwise it wouldn't have been CO2 and the wineskins wouldn't burst. It tells you that fermentation did take place. Jesus did drink. There was alcohol of content in the wine, but no one tell you there wasn't. But it was not strong wine. You'd have to drink <laughs> gallons and gallons to get inebriated. The Talmud tells us that the wine that would be drunk in Jesus' day was two-thirds water. But the Nazarite, he couldn't drink any wine. He couldn't drink any juice. Anything that had the potential to ferment. He couldn't even come near the skins of the grape. Why? Because it's joy. Jewish families have Kiddush Shabbat. They bless the Sabbath with wine. At a bar mitzvah, you have wine. At a Jewish wedding, you in the, in, 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 in the nuptial ceremony, it involves wine. Passover, the four cups, 
you see in the Last Supper, involves wine. Every Jewish feast, every Jewish ritual, every Jewish liturgy involves wine. Wine has to do with joy, something with making the heart glad. But the Nazarite could have no wine because he was to not be a man of joy. Turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 53. Who has believed our report? Verse 1. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, a root out of dry ground. He had no stately form of majesty that we should look upon him. Jesus was not good looking. Nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Like one from whom men hide their face. Jesus was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. There was a reproach on him. He was not good looking. People didn't want to look at him. Okay. So this Nazarene, Jesus of Nazareth, Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef Minef said it. That was his real name. He walked around Galilee 2,000 years ago. And you asked, where is Jesus? They couldn't tell you. But if you asked, where is Rabbi Yeshua Bar Yosef Minef said it, everybody would know he's the one who does the miracles. Okay? The man of sorrow is acquainted with grief, as if men would hide their faces. People wanted to get away from him. Well, the Nazarene looked weird. Yet he was separated to God the way Jesus was. Jesus had no joy until the sacrifice was complete. Once the sacrifice was complete in Numbers chapter 6, you had a sacrifice of burnt offering going up to God, sacrifice of sin, and a sacrifice that brought peace, three of them. Okay. Something from the thigh, strongest bone in the body is a femur. Uh, okay. Shoulder, carrying the burden. Strongest bone in the upper torso is, clav is a clavicle and sternum, okay? With the ribs articulate. So, you had the sacrifice. Once this sacrifice was completed, then we see in Numbers chapter 6 that the Nazarite was able to drink wine. Verse 20. The priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. It's holy for the priest together with the breast offered by waving and the thigh offered by lifting up. Afterwards, the Nazarite may drink wine. He only gets the joy after the sacrifice is completed. Once more, let's look at the Nazarene and Isaiah 53. Verse 11, verse 10, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to, to grief if he would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. Verse 12, he divides the booty with the strong, has a portion with the great. The blessing, the joy Jesus experienced, only happened after he went to the cross and became a sacrifice to our sin. You understand? It was the, before that, he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. People didn't even want to look at him. Once he made the sacrifice for our sin, once the sacrifice, the soothing aroma, the sacrifice for sin and the sacrifice that brought peace, once that happened, then Jesus was happy. Then he had joy. Nazarite, Nazarene. No joy. No wine. Nothing vaguely resembling it. Not until the vow was complete, the season was complete, the sacrifice took place, then he had the wine. It's a picture of Jesus, isn't it? Okay? Well, that's interesting stuff, but what does it mean for us? Let's continue to look. This idea of the reproach of the Lord. Turn with me, please to Judges chapter 13, verses 5 to 7. For behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son. No razor shall come upon his head, 
For the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Then the husband came and told, and the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God has come to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from, nor did he tell me his name. But he said, Behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son. And now you shall not drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing, for the boy shall be called a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Notice the vow of the Nazarite could be taken by a male or a female. Either could take it. Now, if there's anything worse than a man who's not too nicely groomed, <laughs> it's a girl. <laughs> you know, I can get away with not getting a haircut until my wife complains, you know. But the girl can't do that. <laughs> girl can do it. Okay. Now, you have a story here where an angel comes announces a supernatural conception of a son going to be born to a woman who couldn't have a baby. Her husband isn't there. Her husband is skeptical of what the woman tells the husband. The husband needs further revelation and confirmation. The woman is told that the baby would die and that he wouldn't have any wine, any joy. Okay. But therefore, she wouldn't have any either. What does it say in Luke's nativity narrative? Let's look at what Simeon told Mary. From the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 2, the prophecy of Simeon, his father and mother in verse 32 were amazed at the things which were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, the child is appointed for the rise and fall of many in Israel, and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your own soul. Okay. Her son would too be, die, the same as the parents of Samson were told their son would die. But a sword would pierce Mary's heart, Mary, Miriam's heart. She wouldn't have any joy either. Thus, the person prefiguring her in the Old Testament, the mother of Samuel, couldn't have any wine either. You understand? It's a picture. Every supernatural conception in the Old Testament is a type of Christ in some way. The last one is John the Baptist. But Sarah, okay. Leah, um, certainly the parents of Samuel, the parents of Hannah, yes, and the parents of, 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 of here, of, of Samson. Every supernatural conception in the Bible is a picture there's a foreshadowing of the incarnation of Jesus in some way. It, it highlights or typifies some aspect of the supernatural conception and birth of Jesus. And this is a clear one. The angel comes and announces it, that there's going to be death involved, that there's going to be opposition involved, okay? That there'll be no joy at first, and no joy for you either at first. A picture of what would happen to Christ. Samson's a picture of Jesus. A man of unbelievable strength that came directly from God that other people couldn't understand. This is what the vow of the Nazarite means. Turn to Judges 16, 15 to 20. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You've deceived me these three times and have not told me where your great strength is. And it came about when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him that his soul was annoyed to death. So he told her all that was in his heart and said to her, A razor has never come on my head, for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I'm shaved, all my strength will leave, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Now we'll come back to this bit in a moment. But it's not the main point. The story of Samson itself is not the main point. The main point for our purposes now is the vow of the Nazarite. This hair made him look weird and crazy. It separated him from other people. It made him an emblem of reproach. It made him somebody who was isolated. 
Yet it gave him an incredible strength that others could not understand. Those who take the reproach of the Lord will have a strength that even other Christians will not be able to comprehend. Those who take the reproach of the Lord will be endowed with the supernatural strength of some description that other people will not be able to grasp. There's a price. Those who take the reproach of the Lord will lack joy, as men count joy. Those who take the reproach of the Lord will be isolated. Those who take this reproach will be somebody that other people won't want anything to do with. Yet they will have a strength. They are not weak like other men. In taking the reproach, they're endowed with a strength. God's values are always the opposites of man's. To us, a reproach would be a thing of weakness. But in our weakness, his strength is magnified. You see? The reproach of the Lord. The reproach of the Lord is going to be a big and big and big issue in the last days. The churches who stand faithful when the others go down the road to Babylon. The pastor who won't join the minister's fraternal with the liberal Protestant minister and the Roman Catholic priest. Be a thing of reproach. Oh, those people. Oh, that church. Oh, that guy. That, that preacher. Reproach. Those who will stand up and say, <laughs> be a reproach on them. A reproach. You think they would get fed up with it? Because there's a misery, a certain kind of misery associated with it. How do they do it? How does a Christian take this kind of reproach? How can they sustain themselves? They can't. The reproach itself begets the strength. Those who will take the reproach of Jesus will share in his power more than other men. Churches willing to take the reproach of Jesus will have more of his power than churches who want to be like the world. How often you lack joy. But it's only temporary. Then there's joy unspeakable. Now understand this. We talked about, last time I was here, from Leviticus 21, about the typology of the dead bodies. If the Nazarite came in contact with the corpse, he had to begin over. You get involved with an unsaved person, you've got to begin over. That's what happened to Samson, didn't it? He got involved with an unbeliever. When you take the vow of the Nazarites, to be in a male, a female, a pastor, a group. In the book of Acts, it was a group. It could be a church. If they're willing to take the reproach of the Lord, you become a target. Because you have more strength than other people. Other people don't know it. Or they, they know it, but they can't understand it. The devil knows it. The first thing to look out for is always spiritual seduction. You know from my teaching how the wicked women, women in the Bible, particularly Jezebel, Delilah, Queen Athliah, Herodias, how they're pictures of the harlot in Revelation. They're all spiritual pictures of the harlot. The same as the good women in the Bible are pictures of the bride of Christ, like Ruth and Esther and Rachel and Mary. They're pictures of the bride of Christ. When Shulamit from the Song of Solomon, the wicked women in the Bible are pictures of the harlot, aren't they, in the book of Revelation? You tolerate the woman Jezebel, I saw the great whore. Okay. Now, some of you may know this from our tapes, but we'll just look at it very briefly. Turn to Proverbs chapter 6, verse 24. To keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Understand the Midrash. The physical level, the obvious level, is always the peshet, peshet, 
the simple interpretation. It's talking about literal whoredom, literal harlotry. The spiritual meaning is the pesher, spiritual seduction. The peshet is Jezebel was the seductress who seduced Ahab. The spiritual meaning is what we see about her in Revelation. She's a spiritual seductress. Okay? Look out for her. Keep you away from her in Proverbs 6, 24 to 26. Do not desire her beauty in your heart, nor let her eye catch you with her eyelids. For on account of a harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread, and an adulteress hunts for a precious life. <laughs> Samson was a precious life. Those who take the reproach of the Lord are precious. They're identifying with Jesus as an outcast. They're taking his reproach. Precious. You know, the war of the media, there's a lot of ministers, decent men, who know what's on this idiot box with the TV, and they know it's wrong. They know it's false. Why are guys like Josh McDowell and, 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 and Chuck Smith and Charles Stanley, why are they involved with these people? Why, why, are, they, why are they taken in by spiritual seduction? So let's look. Proverbs 7, 21 and 22. With many persuasions, she entices him. With her flattering lips, she seduces him. Suddenly he follows her as an ox goes to slaughter, or as one in fetters to the discipline of a fool. Doesn't that sound like Samson and Delilah? Proverbs 5, 8 and 9. Keep your way far from her. Don't go near her house, lest you give your vigor to others and your years to the cool one. The first way a Nazarite will be targeted is with spiritual seduction. You know, it's amazing. The same as in the peshet, the simple world, you can get a godly man, good father, good husband, good Christian, and in a moment of weakness, he falls into adultery with some woman. You know, how, how can such a good guy be a sucker for a babe? So how would it be cruel? But it happens. And it, it, it's happening more and more often. Well, that's, that's, that's the peshet. The pesher is, how can these good preachers be sucked in by these con artists? You know what I'm saying? It's the same. They get taken in. Look out for her. Spiritual seduction. Look at Amos chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, please. Back for a moment, if you will, to the book of Amos. Amos chapter 2, Amos Hanavi Perek Bet. Verses 11 and 12. Then I raised up some of your sons to be prophets, and some of your young men to be Nazarites. Is this not so, O sons of Israel, declares the Lord? But you made the Nazarites drink wine, and you commanded the prophets, saying, You shall not prophesy. God has prophetic voices today, but they tell him, Shut up, don't tell us that stuff. We don't want to hear that stuff. Don't prophesy. True prophets are saying that God's judgment is coming on America because of abortion, especially partial birth abortion. It is barbarian. When you saw the President of the United States in Chicago at, at Bill Hybels' church, did Bill Hybels do anything politically incorrect, like accost the President for his support of partial birth abortion or his support of homosexuality and lesbian? No. No, no, no. Tell the prophets to shut up. <laughs> we don't want to hear that. Judgment is coming. Tell him why? He doesn't want to take the reproach. You understand? You make the Nazarite drink the wine. Come on, you have to have fun. You have to have some joy. Lighten up and joy. <laughs> that is the joy in the Lord. But it's not the joy. It's not the joy of the world. You made the Nazarites drink wine. The peer pressure. The, the, the people who will compromise with the world, the people who will give place to the seductress, have a drink. Come on. They make the Nazarites drink wine. 
that want to get us into pursuing a joy and a happiness in this world. Now, I'm not talking about being consecrated to misery. I'm not talking about that. Thank God for the blessings of family and marriage and fellowship and good time. I'm not against that. But you know what? The places I go, China, I met Christians who spent their whole lives in prison. They didn't have any wine. Am I better, am I better than they are because I happen to be born in New York and I live in England? There's Christians in Nigeria being burned out of house and home as we stand here right now. Did you see the president speak up for the Christians in Nigeria when he was there for you two weeks, two, two weeks ago? Look, I, don't, I'm not trying to be political here. I keep my political views separate from my Christian views, but I will speak on moral issues, and I will speak for the rights of Christians. There are Christians who have no wine. They have no joy. Even the things we can take to meet in a place like this, Thank God for this. We can fellowship. We can sing the hymns. We all have Bibles. Our children are out there. Our families are wives. You go home with your family. Go out to a restaurant with people from the church. There's Christians in Africa and Asia that don't have this. They have no wine. They have a joy. But no wine. Their wine is coming. And their wine is going to be the best. They've earned it. Those Christians being burned, being burned in Sudan. Little black kids being burned by Muslims. Nobody's saying a word about it. Their wine is going to be the best vintage. Those Christians in Iran, some of the believers I've met in Asia, their wine is going to be the best. But they want to make the Nazarite drink the wine, you see. Have a good time. Laugh. Get tired away. Frolic. Celebration, praise. What are they praising? It's the worship of worship. I've said that many times. They're pursuing joy. You pursue the Lord. The joy is a result of pursuing the Lord. They're just pursuing... Instead of pursuing the Lord and getting the joy from pursuing the Lord, they're pursuing the joy, and the Lord just becomes a vehicle to get the joy. They have to have the boots on the wrong feet. But it's a false joy. They're drinking cheap wine. They're drinking Bally High. They're drinking Swiss Up. They're not drinking. They're, they're not drinking Chateau Neuf du Pop. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not drinking Beaujolais. They're, they're winos. They make the Nazarites drink wine. Tell the prophets don't prophesy. Make the Nazarites drink wine. That's what happens. But this hair, there's a reproach that comes from looking like this. What is this hair? Again, you have to understand the Midrash. Turn with me, please, to the book of Ezekiel. Prophet Ezekiel, please, chapter 5. Ezekiel chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. As for you, son of man, take a sharp sword and take it and use it as a barber's razor on your head and beard. Then take scales for weighing and divide the hair. One third you shall burn in the fire at the center of the city when the days of the siege are completed. Then you shall take one third and strike it with the sword all around the city, and one third you shall scatter to the wind, and I will unsheathe the sword after them. The Hebrew word here for wind is the same word for spirit, ruach. Now you have this thing of the judgments on the Jews comes in, coming in thirds. It's interesting. Zacharias is the same thing. In the Great Tribulation, Hatekel Fata Tzarat Yaakov, Time of Jacob's trouble, two-thirds are killed. One-third of world's Jewry and two-thirds of European Jewry were killed in the Holocaust of the 30s. It's in the Bible, but it's also, this, this prophecy is about the judgment coming in thirds has always worked out historically in Jewish history. Okay. But take a few in number from among them and bind them in the edge of your robes. And take again some of them and throw them into the fire and burn it with fire. From it, a fire will spread to the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem, etc., etc. The hair, he had to shave it off. One third, he had to beat it with the sword. One third, burn it. One third, throw it into the wind. Only a few hairs were left and he had to put it in the fringe of his garment. Now understand this. Matthew 10:30. The very hairs of your head are numbered. 
We are the body of Christ. You've heard the Midrash on how the different anatomical members are different kinds of Christians. You know, the eye is the lamp of the body. The eye is sound, the body will be sound, but thy word is the lamp, teaches. And shod your feet with the shoes of the gospel of peace. Right? Put on the shoes of the gospel, the feet of evangelists. Well, different anatomical members, different components of the body are, are, are different kinds of believers. The hair. When the high priest was anointed in Psalm 133, they point, poured the oil on the head of the body. The high priest representing Jesus, we're told in Hebrews, right? And the anointing, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the oil, came off the head, which is Jesus, a picture of Jesus, all the hair, down over the robe, never touched the flesh. That's why corrupt preachers can sometimes see miracles and healings. Oh, well, you, somebody was actually healed at one of these Benny Hinn things. Well, I'd like to see it medically documented. He can't seem to come up with it, but even if he could... Jesus said, Depart from me, I never knew you. Yeah, you did the miracles, but get lost. You don't know them by their gifts, you know them by their fruits. The oil never touches the flesh. The miracle of healing, these prove nothing about anyone except the Lord Jesus. Never about us. Never about us. Okay? The hair. Not a hair of your head will perish. The hairs of the head are numbered. But when the heads are shaved off, God removes his people from the body. You understand? However, Ezekiel had to take some of the hairs and instead of them being burned or struck with the sword or scattered to the wind, that's where the Jews were dispersed among the nations and some of them were destroyed when Jerusalem was burned by the Babylonians and some were killed, a third, a third, a third. But a remnant, he put them in the... What was, now, you know what the tassels are, tzitziot, uh, okay? If you've ever seen Orthodox Jew with a prayer shawl called the talit, You'll see the tassels, 613 tassels, one for each of the law of the Torah. In other words, the faithful Jews, the Torah kept them. You understand? They didn't get destroyed. They didn't get burned or scattered or, or, or killed with the sword. Ezekiel kept some. The law kept them. Those who remained faithful to the Lord, to the scriptures, it kept them. You understand what it's saying here? Okay? The word of God, you depart from the word of God, you're walking on very thin ice. Okay? But the, those who kept this law were... The Lord will always have a remnant. No matter how bad Israel ever, ever became or is today, the Lord will always have a remnant of Jews. And the Lord will always have a remnant of Christians in the church. No matter how bad it gets, those, those who keep his word will be preserved. You see, his law, his word preserves. Shalom Rav Le'elavei Torah Techa. Great peace to those who love your word. Okay? He will keep them with his word. Okay? So the hairs were kept, not a hair of your head will perish. But here, when the people wouldn't repent, whoosh, 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 that's it. The hairs perished. Only the remnant who kept his word were preserved. You understand? Now Ezekiel is called the Son of Man. That's the eschatological title of Jesus. He's a type of Christ in his second coming. We've explained this on other tapes, and we'll look at it more deeply when we look at Ezekiel 44 one of these days I'm here, one of these evenings. Now understand the moving of this hair, what it meant. In Second Samuel chapter 10, verse 4, when the hair was totally removed, and it was a sign of humiliation. Remember it was David's men? And they had to stay until the hair grew back? The Nazarite had to stay until the hair grew back. Your strength was gone. Samson had to stay until the hair grew back. Your strength was gone. You lose the reproach. <laughs> you lose the strength. It's a strange thing. How can what the world sees as reproach be something that, that, that's a thing of strength? Why? Because it separates you to the Lord. His strength is magnified in our weakness. Look at Isaiah 50, verse 6. I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out my beard. They literally ripped his beard out of his face. Terrible. Yet, not a hair of your head will perish. <laughs> By taking the reproach, we have a strength that will preserve us. 
The world will not be able to understand this. The world has never been able to understand it. Delilah couldn't understand Samson's strength. But if you take the reproach of the Lord, he won't understand yours either. It will be a mystery. It will be a secret between you and God. You'll understand it. You'll understand it. Other people won't. All they're going to see is a reproach, an outcast. Look at that church. Look at that pastor. Look at that guy. Look at her. She won't come to Women's Aglow and do it this old. She, he, she won't go to the reproach. That's all they're going to see is reproach. How does he stand it? Because of your strength. But a time comes when that reproach is taken away. A time comes because you would take the reproach of Jesus, you share in the blessing and in the victory of Jesus. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great and divide the booty with the strong. Oh, the joy is coming. The reproach is going and the joy is coming. Once more in Numbers chapter 6, what does it say? Verse 20. The priest shall wave the wave offerings. One was for peace, one was for worship, and one was for sin. And afterwards, the Nazarite may drink the wine. The reproach will go. The wine will flow. That's what happened to Jesus. But we get sidetracked. So often, when you have a seductress around trying to get you into spiritual seduction, when your own brethren are trying to make you drink wine, as Amos warned, it's not just the seductress. When your own brethren are trying to make the Nazarene or Nazarite drink wine, it's easy to get sidetracked. You know, when I used to read the story of Samson as a young believer, I would marvel and say, how could this guy who was so gifted, who had so much on the ball, who had all this, all this, how could he have been so sick. How could he have been so stupid? How could he have been so naive? That's what I used to say when I was a young Christian. You know what I say now? Forget about Samson. I have to take the log out of my own eye. Jacob, how can you be so sick? How can you be so stupid? Look what God's given you. How can you be so naive? Hair comes off and you have to begin letting it grow all over. Just like in Numbers 6. Or in Judges 16, verse 15, he found the fresh jawbone of a donkey, so he reached out and took it and killed a thousand men with it. Then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I've killed a thousand men. And it came about when he finished speaking that he threw the jawbone from his hand and named the place Ramat Lehi, like the lifted up place of the jawbone. And he became very thirsty and called to the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance by thy hand of thy servant, by the hand of thy servant. Now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? But the Lord split the hollow place that is in Lehi, so the water came out of it. And when he drank, his strength returned and revived. Therefore he named it En Hakor, which is in Lehi to this day. It means the place where you cry out in desperation. Where you like, it's more than calling out, it's like in desperation you cry out. You see, 
the Lord knows those who take his reproach are but men. We're weak. We can fall for spiritual seduction. We can come in contact with a corpse. We can give in to pressures by even other believers who try to make us drink the wine. The Lord knows our weakness. That is why in the vow of the Nazarite, he made a provision. You can always begin over. You goof it up. I goof it up. Maybe you goof it up. Churches goof it up. Even good churches goof it up. But the Lord in his mercy says, now you can begin over. Pick up the jawbone, go back to the fight. The hair will grow back. His wonderful mercies. I don't know why he puts up with me. I wouldn't put up with me, but I thank God that I'm not God. Because if I was God, I wouldn't be here. I would have got rid of me a long time ago. And then the time came when the vow was completed. And when the vow was completed, again in verse 20, he could drink the wine, he'd have the joy. And then the blessing came. When the vow was completed, when he took the reproach, he made the sacrifice. The reproach was taken away. The wine, the joy, how was for him? Then and only then could the blessing be pronounced. And I want this blessing. But I know to take this blessing, to get this blessing, and to be able to pronounce this blessing on others. Weak as I am, unworthy as I am, feeble as I am, I have to be willing to take the reproach of the Lord. That is my only strength. But the reproach will be taken away. And the Lord's wine is the best vintage we can imagine. More than we can imagine. That blessing will come. Then the Lord will speak. Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. Thus you shall bless the believers in grace. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Yevarecha Adonai be Yishmarecha. Yaer al Adonai Panavelecha be Yechunecha. Yisa Adonai Panavelecha be Yeselecha. Shalom. Shalom to you tomorrow. We hope you have enjoyed Grounded in the Word with Jacob Prash. We hope this teaching ministry is a blessing to you and a tool to equip you with the understanding of God's Word so you will not be deceived by today's false teachers. Please visit our website at moriel.org. M-O-R-I-E-L dot O-R-G and sign up for the Moriel Ministries newsletter. Join us again next week for another helping of the meat of God's Word.